Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. I thank you each and every one of you who joined the last night for streaming. I know the streaming didn't really go very well. There was some problem with the video on my end, but I'm glad that some of you still stick around and we had quite a good discussion in the live chat section. And based on the feedback from some of you, I would be starting a Telegram group in which I can take your questions and post some updates. And of course, anything that is slightly beyond the scope of this course, we can also discuss it there. And as I spoke in the last video that we have already completed all the prerequisites that would be needed for the navier Stokes equations or for the actual CFD. So in today's lecture and onwards, we would be dealing with the solution of these flow itself. So the things are going to get really interesting from now on. So without any further delay, let's get started with the lecture today. So let me start by writing the various equations that are needed for the solution of fluid flow. The first one is called as the continuity equation, which physically represents the conservation of mass. So uh, for today, we'll start with the 2D scenarios. So it means that we would have two velocities components, u and v, where u is the velocity in the x direction and v is the velocity in the y direction. Or in other words, u is the x component of the velocity vector and v is the y component of the velocity vector. So far in our discussion, we already knew what the u and v were. So for example, in the last lecture, we assumed that both u and v were equal to 1 and then we evaluated the temperature field. But this is, unfortunately, this is not really the case all the time. So typically, we want to evaluate this flow field and only according to the flow field, we evaluate the further variables such as temperature or energy. So the calculation of the flow field itself requires the solution of the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes or the momentum equation. So we have two equations for the momentum. One is for the x momentum and one is for the y momentum. The x momentum equation is written in this particular form. We have the time derivative term, we have the convective terms, then we have a pressure gradient term and then we have a diffusion term again with the second derivative of the velocity field. So this becomes the convection, this becomes the diffusion and this becomes the pressure gradient. Now I'm writing these equations in a little simplified way and I'm writing these equations in what is called as a dimensionalized form. So if you're not very familiar with how these equations are obtained, I would link up some books in the description so that you can go ahead and have a look. Of course, I don't have uh, enough time in this particular series so that we can go around the derivation of these equations. But I'm pretty sure that there are many videos available on YouTube or any other platform where you can find the derivation of these equations. Physically, these equations are the representative of Newton's second law of motion and they say that the force or the net force that is experienced by a fluid element is equal to the rate of change of momentum or mass times acceleration. So we have the pressure and the viscous forces that are experienced by a fluid element and we have pressure forces and viscous forces being equal to the mass times acceleration which is written on the left hand side of the momentum equations. And similarly for the y momentum we have del v over del t, del u v over del x plus del v square over del y minus del p over del y plus 1 divided by r e, del square v divided by del x square plus del square v divided by del y square. In these equations, the r e term, it indicates the Reynolds number. Because we have written these equations in the non-dimensionalized form, 
That is why the only non-dimensional parameter that is occurring in these equations is the Reynolds number. Everything else, u, v, and p, those are the non-dimensionalized velocities and pressure. So, more or less, the computational guys they always deal with these non-dimensionalized quantity, and they are not really very much bothered about what sort of units they are having. They like to deal with non-dimensional parameters. So. To give you a better understanding of how we can solve these equations on the kind of grids that we have been dealing with so far, let us consider a one dimensional scenario. So for a one dimensional scenario, we would have the continuity equation simply of the form del u over del x being 0. And let us say we have only the x momentum, then the x momentum equation will become del u divided by del t plus del u squared divided by del x equals to minus del p divided by del x plus 1 by r e del square u divided by del x squared. Now let me give you an idea of how we would solve these equations on the grid systems that we have been using so far. So remember we have this initial point p which is our point of interest we take some points around it, then we create a control volume, the same code story. Let us see how that fits in here. So let us say we define a 1D grid with a point P sitting in the center, the point E on the east, W on the west. So if I consider a control volume around point P, so I hope that this wouldn't be looking very strange or unfamiliar to you. So we all already know how to uh, use these approach for the convection term and the diffusion term. The new term here is the pressure gradient. So let us look at how the pressure gradient term would be discretized here. So it means that minus del P over del X, it would become minus of p at small e minus p at small w divided by delta x or p w minus p small e divided by delta x. And if we use the linear operator or the central differencing, we can write p w as p capital W plus p capital P divided by 2 minus the small e would become the average of p p and p e divided by 2 times delta x. After you do a little algebra, it is very easy to show that the, this becomes Pw minus Pe divided by 2 delta x. Now, there is a very small problem once we do this. So we started with the calculation of pressure gradient at the point P and it turned out that the pressure gradient is only dependent on the pressure of these two points. So let us assume that the pressure here are equal, but the pressure here is not the same as these two. So you would assume that because the pressure across these two points, because that is equal, the momentum equation would say that there is no pressure difference across this line, but in actual, there is a pressure gradient because this point has a pressure difference with respect to these two points. Let me try to show you a bit better. So let us assume that the pressure at this point is 50 units and this is 50 as well. And the point P has a pressure of 100 units. So when you try to get the del P by del X, it would turn out to be zero, which indicates that the algorithm would think that there is no pressure difference at this particular point. There is no pressure gradient at this particular point when indeed there is. So the algorithm would think that we have a uniform pressure field and if we have a uniform pressure field while in reality we don't. So that creates a conflict in the situation. And I'll show you that this is also the case with the continuity equation. So we had the continuity equation as del u divided by del x equals to 0. So if I take the same control volume, okay, p small e small w, capital W and capital E. 
So the control volume integrated for this continuity equation, we would have u small e minus u cap small w equals to zero. And if we substitute again the same that minus u p plus u w divided by two equals to zero, it says that u capital E minus u capital W equals to zero. Again, considering a hypothetical situation where we have these three points, or rather consider let's say five points where we have u as 100, 400, 100, 400, 100. So here we have a non-uniform velocity field, right? We have, we have the variation in x. We are starting from 100, then 400, then 100, then 400, then 100. So we have a non-uniform velocity field, but if you consider, let's say, this particular point at the center, and if you evaluate del u by del x, it would be zero because it says u e minus u w. So mathematically, we are seeing that the u e minus u w becomes zero. All the velocity gradient is zero. But in reality, we don't have the case. So it means that there is some sort of problem that is occurring while we are trying to map this pressure and velocity system onto our grids. And that is what precisely happens if you try to solve Navier's stokes equation on the grid systems that we have been using so far. And you can't really exactly solve it straight away. You need some sort of modifications to that. So there is a way to correct that and that is called as using a staggered grid arrangement. So what the idea of staggered grid was, so far we have been defining everything on the grid points. So if this was point P, this was point E and W, we always said that U, V, T, all the five were defined at the grid point. But this becomes a problem when you try to solve the Navier Stokes equation. So what we do instead is, we say that we don't define all the variables at a single point. We stagger or we displace some of the variables. So rather than defining all of them at the same point, we define some of the variable here, but stagger some of the variables. Let me show you what I mean. So let's start with the staggered grid arrangement in one dimension. So again, we take the example of point P, point E, and point W. So we say that we define the pressures here, but for the velocity, we define the velocity in the center. So roughly, if you sketch a control volume around point P, the u velocity is defined at the control volume phase. So we have staggered the u component of velocity with respect to pressure. So let us see what that does mathematically. So if I want to calculate, let us say del p by del x, the important thing to note here is that it appears in the x momentum equation. Or in other words, we have to consider a control volume that is different. So we have to consider the control volume corresponding to the u velocity. So now we have two different kinds of control volumes. One is for pressure that is centered around point P. One is for u velocity or the u control volume, which is now centered around the u component of velocity where we have defined it or where we have redefine or stagger the u component. So if you take the u component of velocity and make a control volume around it, you'll see that the del p over del x term for the control volume here. So we are using the control volume here and it's very easy to see that the del p by del x, it simply becomes p capital E minus p capital P divided by delta x. And similarly, if you take the control volume for the pressure, so I'm taking this particular shaded region here. 
And if I write the continuity equation now, which is del u by del x equals to 0, we see that the del u by del x, if I define this component as p and this component as w, so we see that the del u by del x on the, let me go back, on this particular control volume, that is for pressure, it becomes equals to up minus uw divided equals to 0. So the idea here was when we consider the x momentum or the u velocity equation, we had the pressure gradient term and previously the problem was the pressure gradient was across the two points or alternate points and once we stagger the velocity field, we saw that because the velocity was defined at a different point, the pressure gradient was between two successive points and that is how that particular problem is resolved. On the other hand, for the continuity equation, once we redefine the velocity at the control volume phases, the control volume for pressure, the point P, the point capital P, it included the nearby velocity components which indicates that the del u by del x should be equals to zero when it is physically equals to zero. So in this way, we can remove that discrepancy between the physical and the computational approaches. And this staggered grid concept becomes absolutely important. You can try to solve the Navier-Stokes equations on the previous kind of grid system, which is in computational way, it's called as the co-located grid which indicates that all the variables are located on the same point. So hopefully you will appreciate the concept of staggered grid and we will wind up the lecture here. In the next lecture, we will discretize the uh, Navier-Stokes equations on these staggered grids. But before we do that, I would also explain these staggered grid in two dimensions because in this particular uh, lecture series, we would be solving a lot of 2D flow problems. So you need to have a better understanding of how the 2D staggering would look like and how the different control volumes are. In case of any questions, please write in the comments and I'll put the telegram link in the description so that you can also join the group and post your questions there. If you like this video, I would very, very much appreciate if you can uh, like the video and uh, share it with your friends who are also learning CMD. Till then, uh, I hope to see you soon and I wish you a very good luck.